It's time to get trapped with no way out in E2M8 Elevator Trouble! I'll be honest, the concept of this map is just kind of annoying. Cheap shotting and confusing labyrinths. As the map name suggests, there's a lot of elevators, which means a lot of waiting around. You know you're in for a cheap shotting when the start of the map immediately has enforcers on you before you can even properly react. No, I'm not going to entirely rip this map apart, it still has some room for exploration and you can at least say it's fairly challenging. The only problem is, by the standards of most Rise of the Triad maps, it's fairly weak and probably the first secret map to feel like a gimmick. I think I'd rather have a short map than one that feels dragged out, the one secret map I'd pass over. It's time to avoid falling rocks in E4M9 Canyon Chase. Kinda of fitting that Oscuro is a snake, because the map itself is literally just a giant snake full of long-ranged monks, it's basically a big chase sequence. If you don't care to stay and fight, which you can get away with if you weave around, the map can be beaten in basically two minutes. Its sole purpose is basically to chase a Skiro, so it really doesn't have anything going for it apart from being a gauntlet of a single enemy type. Would have been more interesting if you start chasing him, then you have to take a detour for the real map. This just feels way too short for comfort. It's time to get a bouncy disturbance in E1M6, Spring Surprise! This is definitely the most filler map yet, I finished it in around 7 minutes on my first go, which is less than half than pretty much all the others. It had more or less nothing new to offer either, like the off-elevator pressure plate area taken straight from Metal Threat, which actually did it better. The only thing I thought it did well was the visuals, fog with red sky and stone walls with a 4 block high ceiling. It very much comes across as a map that was just quickly made as something to get the episode over with as we head into the boss map. It's still not a terrible map, if the worst thing is being way too short then it could be far worse, but still weak compared to the rest. It's time to accept our overwhelming defeat in E4M3, Crushing Defeat! As the name suggests, it's fairly densely packed with hazards, from fire launchers to spinning blades to the usual fire jets along with the episode-centric monks. The Hall of Spiked Brick Pillars are probably the closest thing to fully representing the map's name. Sadly, the map is also a bit too short and cramped for my liking, and not because of the indoor low ceiling, because other maps have done it more effectively. Ultimately, the hazards are a neat gimmick, but the map just doesn't have enough meat to it for my liking. It's time to take the other, other, other option in EDM3, the fourth door. This map doesn't have too much new, other than the first jug power-up in the form of the Shrooms mode. It causes your view to shake around, threats to be starkly colorful, and in the ludicrous edition, interestingly enough, the walls will stretch and shrink horizontally. Other than that, it uses mechanics from the previous maps like flames and crusher walls, albeit with some interesting twists like a big wall of fire. It also centers around a main area where new areas open up as switches are pressed in the off rooms, which is interesting for a backtracking kind of thing. Ultimately, it's a map that has few surprises, but it's still a solid map and is engaging enough to leave a positive impression. It's time to get all lost in the clouds in EDM2 Foggy Mountain. This one adds some interesting new things, even if I found the poison gas borderline to be an annoying mandatory hazard, but at least there's a gas mask. It also interestingly introduces the idea of push walls that have to be unlocked, both via touch plates and via switches, making it more complex than Doom in some ways. Even introduces the idea of spinning blade contraptions that can be let loose and even pose a danger to your enemies, giving them some strategic use. Even what was introduced prior is given more complexity, like a crusher ceiling that dances around a bit unpredictably. Overall, I'd say it's not quite as memorable as the first map, but it's certainly enjoyable on its own merits and adds enough to be interesting. It's time to tame some cattle at EDM6, ride em cowboy! I'm not so sure about this map, it has points of no return and waiting around for platforms, which I'm not so much a fan of. On the other hand, the more open spaces I feel actually fit Rise of the Triad better, probably because the ceilings can be inflated as much as they are and the verticality complements it. The sky insta-killing you admittedly does provide an interesting mild challenge at the start. The only thing that truly irritated me was at the end where enemies seemed to shoot at you through brick pillars and you couldn't hit back, but you can retaliate once you get around it. Overall, decently good map, but it could certainly be better. It's time to get lost and gusty in E1M2, Winding Way. The map's name is sadly accurate in that it's kind of a linear line forward. There's secrets, of course, but a little more variance in your path would be nice. On the plus side, it introduces Dog Mode, a twist on God Mode where you're still invincible but you're a dog that can maul people and go into low-to-the-ground spaces. 
Thankfully, it at least doesn't feel repetitive and will include things like verticality or gates to a skybox to make areas feel different even if they're samey snaking corridors. Maybe I shouldn't be hard on this map for being a bit on the linear side since it's not like the majority of them are sprawling, but it's still a shame that it feels so straightforward. It's time to feel the burn from behind in E4M5 Backfire! This is another small ceiling indoor which weirdly tends to lead to more cramped maps which I don't get since Wolf 3D had much bigger maps at that height. The whole map consists of going a ring loop around the map, some minor secrets, but not anything too special. The Indiana Jones boulder area almost seems cruel since you're going against the direction of them, but at least there's a secret to potentially bypass it. There's also a secret to block the fire spitter leading to the exit, interestingly enough. Ultimately, it's a not-so-great map just full of hazards and monks. It's time to stop at a red light in E2M6, the four-way chamber. So, it's largely a straight line to the exit, essentially like Winding Way, but expectedly a great deal more difficult. Sure, there are secret areas to take you off the beaten path, but your options moving forward aren't exactly the most vast compared to most others. I will say to its credit that it's a substantially better penultimate map than the first episode since it's at least tough and has some length to it. Enforcers, over patrols, environmental hazards, it runs the whole gamut, so it's not like it's a brain-dead map. I just wish it did a little more to encourage exploration. I'm not as big a fan of maps that run you in a straight line like it's a glorified on-rails shooter. It's time to pull vault in the best way in E3M2, down and over. For the most part, this is another map that feels a little straight line for my liking, though at least it loosens up a little as you get keys. More than a little waiting for elevators, especially if you want everything, so that's a bit annoying. In following the episode's theme, of course, robots spliced in with enforcers and other human enemies, marking the need for explosives. I wouldn't say the map has all that much, though. Even in terms of secrets, it's on the shallower end with a secret key just getting you to a long haul with score-gaining items. Overall, it's another map that isn't particularly bad, but it could have been better, too. Just very average, much like the previous one. It's time to get out of the pan and into E4M2, Fire and Brimstone. As the name may suggest, it brings on the fire with liberal use of fire crusher walls, flame launchers, and lovely little puddles of lava all made to try to burn you to a crisp. Interestingly, it's the only map I can think of that gives you a choice between one of two keys to progress. Either one leads to the exit, of course, but they take you down different hallways in getting there, so either more pools of lava or spinning blades await you. I didn't like there being a point of no return, though, and the map's overall a bit on the linear side, but it's still pretty solid. It's time to get totally lost in E1M4, too much room. I'll be honest, compared to the previous maps, this one's a little bit of a letdown. While not as linearly inclined as Winding Way, its map structure leaves a little to be desired in terms of exploration. Plenty of obstacles, including Indiana Jones boulders, crusher walls, and flame traps, but some more room for poking around would always be appreciated. The design is at least serviceable enough with three block tall indoor environments that often feel just spacious enough without being too overwhelming and the hazards are in point. A few dog mode power-ups are also appreciated too. It's a good and solid map with good design, I just wish it wasn't as linear as it ended up being. It's time to have a chat with a blacksmith in E1M5, two key return. This map is a weird one. It's very much on the small side, but at least it does have a decent amount with many of its rooms. Probably the most interesting one is a system of trampolines to access all areas to get all the score warning items around. It's a pretty weird choice to have both locked doors just be elevators to different areas though, but it's relatively inoffensive. Very interesting system of high ledges in one of the secrets too, having to be good with jumps to get all the way around it. It's only a shame that the rest of the map seems pretty lacking in depth compared to many of the other maps. It's time to pick up some cybernetic style in E3M1 Robo Tricks. As the name suggests, it's a map full of tricks and traps, namely hazards, enforcers, and robots. While there's nothing wrong with that, the map itself just sort of feels average when that wears out. Most of the map consists of narrow, long hallways, which I wouldn't consider the most fun kind of design. I wasn't the biggest fan of the pitfall traps either, especially when they're covering an entry point, so there's no skill in dodging them. While there's at least a couple of ways forward, the overall map feels quite linear as it's broken up into lengthy pathways. Overall, it's a gimmicky map that wears out its luster pretty fast and simply becomes an okay map, nothing spectacular or spectacularly terrible. It's time to get educated on hostile robotics in E3M7, Know Thine Enemy. 
Well, it's certainly the most difficult boss, and I wouldn't really say that's a good thing because it's done with fast homing missiles. Now, you do get a crap ton of health and ammo to fight back, at least, even if they're guarded by ballistic craft, but it didn't really make the boss feel more fun. The map itself isn't exactly complex either, straight lines with some guards leading to the main room with robot guards and the enemy itself. It probably sounds like I hate the boss because it's tough, that's not really the case, but it does mean the boss just is the weakest of the three so far in my opinion. Ultimately, the map isn't terrible, but it could certainly be a lot better overall and not just because of the boss. It's time to channel our inner Megamine in EDM7, boom boom boom! As the last map of the Shareware episode, it doesn't technically have a boss, but it does have enforcers liberally placed everywhere. Those would be the chunky-looking military guys armed with explosive grenades and a machine gun, making them a pretty big threat. Technically, you can use the machine gun to stun them one-on-one, -on -one, but you definitely want to use the explosives on them. Thankfully, the map is very generous with explosives, including the Mighty Firebomb that just has a T-shaped explosion and does a serious amount of damage. In general, the map is all about toughness, from enforcers to environmental hazards, it's basically just one last hurdle the shareware throws at you, and it's pretty good for that. It's time to rock the siege in E2M1 into the castle! This one's pretty good in a dark tunnels on steroids kind of way since it piles on the enforcers. Not the largest map ever, especially with the two block height, but it feels different and there's some room for poking around in. While it makes heavy use of the wait for me obstacles, at least they're a lot faster than the flames on Duke Nukem. The only major point of criticism I have is it's a little too persistently dark at times, but it's not exactly a deal breaker and if you don't break light fixtures, you can generally see where you're going. Given the potential for it to get repetitive if they're all the same, it's good to have variety and this map is a nice change of pace. It's time to bounce around and eat dm 8 wall to wall. Given the name, you may expect it to just be a push wall gimmick and there's plenty of that, but that's not all there is. It's actually a pretty exciting map with a mix of things like touch plate walls, flying platforms, hazards, all that good stuff that shows off the Rise of the Triad engine. I actually like it when game worlds are dynamic like that and Rise of the Triad showcases it beautifully with entire rooms morphing. Not every element hits, waiting for flying platforms is never the best, but you can certainly do a lot worse as far as secret maps are concerned. Given how many are one note or even outright shallow, I have to give credit to this one for genuinely being exciting and having a lot of different elements. It's time to go completely ape sh** in E4M1, monkey business. The map itself isn't too much to write home about, there's a couple of nice secret areas, but it's mostly linear and fairly small. However, it introduces the monk enemies, both the bigger one that drains you and a slender one that attacks you with projectiles. It also introduces the staff though, which is similar to the flame wall and that it just deletes everything directly in front of it. To the map design's credit, it basically zerg rushes the monks, which greatly increases their peril, even the big melee ones can sneak up on you and pose a threat. So the map won't blow you away with its size or openness, but it nicely introduces new elements and is a decent episode starter. It's time to fall into a burning ring in E4M6, Circles of Fire. I'll admit it's interesting how different this map is, very wide open and also very dark, with things like flame walls and monk crystals to light the way. It's a very short map, at least if you have some inkling where to go, but at least one flame wall is fairly hard to get across without taking some burning. I'm pretty sure it's meant to be like one final run into Oscuro's chamber, and I'll give it credit for feeling different, only really just being fairly short. At least that means it doesn't wear out its welcome, so I'll overall say it's a pretty good map for what it is. It's time for Steel Kill and EDM5 Metal Threat. The less so, this map likewise changes things up with a starry night sky that's somewhat darker, but not as dark as the dark tunnels, thankfully. It also takes things up a notch with the robot guards, having several of them, and the flame wall it provides won't work, at least not the actual wall part. There's also a pressure plate puzzle that makes me grateful for the ludicrous addition's enhanced map because I imagine it'd be a shot in the dark otherwise. It seems at this point Rise of the Triad has slowed down and showing all that much new and is focused on presenting it in new ways like torch launchers you can disable. That being said, it's a memorable and solid enough map even if it isn't going to wow you with how much new stuff there is. It's time to feel the ultimate shadows in EDM4 Dark Tunnels. Just when I thought Rise of the Triad might get a touch repetitive, this map subverts my expectations in a genuinely good way. Much more cramped ceilings akin to Wolfenstein 3D and very dark until you light it up a bit with floor lights, which certainly makes it feel different. 
Stumbling in the dark may not be the most fun premise, but I defended Nightmare 3D's lights out and doom had moments like that to very good use too. Notably, it also introduces a single robot guard. They're completely immune to your infinite bullet weapons, so you need an explosive to finish them. Ultimately, my opinion of the map is quite good. It's something very different, and the darkness aspect isn't too hard to navigate. It's time to twist and turn and eat two and four, spiraling in. As the name suggests, it's initially a straight spiral into the center. Once that, though, you get to cut through it via locked doors, which is pretty cool, and there's plenty of side areas to provide variety. It has enemies of all types, from guys holding rocket launchers to over patrols to the beefy enforcer boys, which made it so that I was never really bored. While it's obviously a bit directed initially, there's still plenty of map to poke around in, and there are rewards for exploring and looking around those hidden push walls. Ultimately, I'd say it's still very much a good map, even if it's not the most exciting map Rise of the Triad has to offer. It's time to avoid becoming a pancake in E3M6, moving walls! As you probably gleaned from the name, it's all about push walls and push pillars, and I kinda dig it because I like environmental warping in games as you go through it. The difficulty is about what you'd expect, the usual hazards and enforcers are plenty, though that's not to say they ever lost their edge of being tough. Not a fan of a point of no return, but at least the secret exit is on the other side of it, so you won't be locked out of that if you just look around. Overall, I wouldn't say it's as good as many previous maps, but they've been quite good, so that's not really a point of contempt. Overall, I'd still say it's a pretty good map, even if it's a bit on the linear side. It's time to get all disorientated in E4M8, switched around! I don't know if this is the longest of the Rise of the Triad maps, but it sort of feels like it with the lengthy halls and the backtracking to the beginning. It's not so linear either, it has secrets and rooms for poking around in, which contributes to the overall massive feeling the map has, even if the keys have a strict order. The abundance of monks and hazards means it isn't so easy either, the long-ranged ones especially can ruin your day if you aren't careful. Overall, it's a pretty good secret map with a lot of danger and length, it's a real marathon run! It's time to get nailed in E1M8, turn of the screw! At first glance, this is a relatively straightforward, though still very solid map, mostly about shifting walls, including crusher walls. However, there's still a surprising amount to unpack in terms of optional secret areas, greatly adding to the depth if you choose to explore around. It also seems to introduce a lasto mode, arguably the most detrimental of the power-ups since you're bouncing around while Shroom's mode is easier to control. Much like the previous map, it does a very good job feeling pretty non-linear with its various paths you can take, which is nice. Ultimately, it succeeds as a secret map, and I'd say it's one you don't want to miss out on. It's time to embrace the cringe in E2M3, The Room. This, more than any other map, is basically defined by its hazards. Pretty short, but very intense. It actually doesn't have a single regular enemy in it, opting for fire launchers, spinning blades, spear traps, things like that. It's very simple in nature, not going the farthest it could, but I'll give it credit for being something unique. Usually short and simplistic maps like this would be something I dislike, but you certainly can't make the claim I was being bored here as they tend to be. It's an exciting map for the little burst you're in it for, and I think that places it in a pretty favorable position. It's time to microwave the inevitable in E3M3, dead in five seconds. So this map isn't the most open, but at least there's a nice beefy optional maze to pal around in. It's also a great place to be introduced to the Ballista Craft, a tower robot that's completely indestructible even to god mode, all you can do is avoid its wrath. Staying true to the map's name, it mainly centers around environmental hazards, which you could argue that enemy is part of due to patrolling paths. Fire launchers, fire crush walls, flamethrowers on the ground if you want the dev ball even. Overall, it's a pretty good map with a good sense of overall danger all around it, even if it's not the beefiest of maps ever. It's time for the pretty and oxidized in E4M4, Diamonds and Rust. Well, if nothing else, it's a bit unique, which can only be good compared to just having the same maps over and over. It starts out in an outer area around a main building, which at least gives you a choice of what direction down it you want to go for a bit of non-linearity. A bit of a lift maze near the end of the map, along with some hazards and monks along the way, but I'd say it's overall a strong map that at least feels fresh. Interesting means of getting to the secret exit too, or at least the way I did it, so overall a thumbs up. It's time to practice our one finger salute in E1M7, General Darien. Depending on how you fight him, he could be a surprisingly clever boss on par with Disparal or laughably easy. The first time I made it into his initial room and cheaply obliterated him with fireproof armor. 
Once he gets out of his room, though, he's surprisingly tough with a teleportation mechanic. Since I'm sure that's the intended way, I'll be nice and judge him based on that merits, and he's a good boss when he works. You have to shoot his buttons just to get him out of his bunker, which is an interesting solution since he unleashes spike traps on you otherwise. Even though it's obviously a very short map because it's meant to be just the boss, it's still a very satisfying fight, all things considered. It's time to get Tiny and Red in E2M7, Sebastian Christ. The best way I can describe it is it's more balanced than General Darien, a boss that isn't quite as engaging but feels like a much more complete map. With the usual gang everywhere, including enforcers, the map just getting to the boss isn't exactly going easy on you, it's as you'd expect. That's not to say Sebastian Christ himself is bad by any means, standard rocket launcher and instead of teleporting around, launches mines at you. His design is also pretty interesting, a command chair and it's hard to see in the sprite, but he also has a monocle, which is a nice touch. As a whole, it's still a very satisfying boss map. Chris himself, I'd say, is overall a less engaging boss than Darien, but the rest of the map makes up for it. It's time to get Stone Skin in E2M5 Rocky Plateau. This is a return to the massive type maps, eight blocks tall and with an outdoor skybox, so it just further adds to the sense of scale. That's the beautiful thing about Rise of the Triad. Engine limitations may mean only one floor and ceiling texture in high per map, but at least they have some room for variety. You can have dark one block high halls and then bright eight block high behemoths, and it gives it more personality than you'd find on Wolf 3D. Perhaps the one big criticism I have with this map is it's a little easy to get lost, especially when you factor in touchpads. Still, it was pretty fun to get through, certainly packs on the enemies, and the Ludicrous Edition's updated map really helps getting around. It's time to know what we're in for in E3M4, clear and present dangers. This map sure has its challenging hazards, especially the spinning blade section leading into the exit. While it's not the most open map ever, it has enough branching paths and secrets to give you somewhere to look around. It also helps that while brief, there's a fine three things to access something in any order, which I'm always a fan of because of its non-linearity. The start of the map is actually more interesting if you don't have an explosive weapon, or in my case, didn't want to waste a firebomb since you're near two robots and have to find one. Overall, I'd say it's a fairly decent map that has just the right amount of difficulty to prove interesting. It's time to face Mr. Blackrobe in E4M7, Layer of El Oscuro. This is certainly a map full of interesting surprises like a flame wall that closes in and you have to get out of, or a very large lift that turns out to be a fake. Fittingly, Oscuro himself is unusual because he's invincible in this map and you have to not do anything until he retreats of his own accord. The fact that attacking him just has your attacks worked against you is interesting even though waiting for something to happen isn't the best concept. Still, it's a unique boss map with a decent bit of challenge before then, so I'd say it's overall a very sharp one. It's time to don our thermal vision in EDM1, the hunt begins! It's kind of funny how this game is like a cross between Wolf 3D and Doom and even has aiming which Doom didn't even have. It isn't afraid to throw a lot of concepts on you at once, including the coveted God Mode. Unlike most games, it takes the concept literally with an actual hand of God firing enemies seeking balls of light. Though it still has blocky limitations, it more than compensates with a lot of trampoline verticality. Between dual infinite pistols, explosives, crusher walls, and more, it really shows off the variety right out of the gate. You can tell it's unique to share where they really went out swinging to sell you on the game's features. It's time to feel the needle in E3M5, the Angry Quilt. This is definitely a unique one. There were relatively dark maps before, but this one is taller, more spacious, and more full of hazards like spinning blades and flame walls. The core of the map is around diamond rooms that also form a big diamond, plenty of optional traversing to be had even if the darkness makes it especially treacherous. Rise of the Triad is certainly picking up the heat, both metaphorically and very literally. I'm actually surprised it's finding ways to take the same concepts and pumping them up another notch. For that reason, I can say I enjoyed this map. It's a good escalation of tension, even if I had trouble seeing where I was going, which honestly increased the tension even more. It's time to jump into E1M1, into the thick of it. As far as starter maps go, it's definitely more intricate than The Hunt Begins. It has a nice sense of scale, potentially an MP40 as well as a secret flame wall, and has some nice detailing like castle ridges. I noticed that maps are locked to one heightness as well as one ceiling and floor texture each, probably because Wolf 3D had neither, but each area still feels very unique. It even has a secret a la the monster condo from Doom 2 where it's time sensitive if you're looking for a bigger score and possibly more lives. 
All around, I'd say it's a very good appetizer with good use of heights and hazards to really bring you into the thick of it, hence the map name. It's time to feel the different burnings in E3M8, Eight Ways to Hell. What this map may possibly lack of openness and more than makes up for in how arduous and tricky it can be in a good way. Whether trekking through Indiana Jones boulders or trying to navigate a flame room, it makes pretty good use of elasto mode power-ups to make touching them very risky. Interestingly, also a room full of elevators where you have to find the right to proceed, which definitely felt tricky. Perhaps the most interesting part of the map is bookending and you have to make your way to the beginning of the map to access the exit. This is certainly a beefy map with a lot of twists and turns to keep you on your toes and I think it's an excellent penultimate map. It's time to become mesmerized and well cooked in E1M3, burned and amazed. Contrary to the previous map, this map not only isn't linear but feels absolutely sprawling, especially with the secrets. It also introduces the Over Patrol, a black uniformed guard that has a rope trap and can be a real threat if there's other enemies around to take advantage. I actually like the two unit high ceiling in this map and manages to feel spacious without feeling like it's going overboard. It even offers some verticality including using a flight power up to access otherwise unreachable areas with goodies waiting behind them. All in all, this map is so much better than the previous one with a healthy amount of exploration and a fairly deadly new enemy on top of it. It's time to goodness gracious great halls of fire in E2M2. This map is a grab three keys in any order map, which if you know me, that earns it very high favor from me. Nice and non-linear in it has a pretty wide variety of the different kinds of traps and even adds one in the form of trap holes that burn some health if you fall in. With a four block high ceiling, it also makes the expected use of verticality like trampolines and floating platforms to get around. There's also lifts to take you back to the main room, which is a nice touch and is nicely convenient compared to similar key grab maps on Doom. Frankly, this is just a good map in my opinion, good variety of challenges like traps and enemies like over patrols to keep you on your toes without feeling like it's too much. It's time to shine some light on some disgusting eggs in E4M2 in the dark nest. Oscuro himself isn't too tough if you take advantage of the secrets like the fireproof armor and explosives, but there's a twist. There's two endings, and if you want the good ending where the world isn't destroyed, you have to smash some eggs to deprive Oscuro the next generation of evil. It involves a very specific pressure plate to get a key and then getting over a gap and smashing the majority of the eggs before tackling Oscuro himself. Just Oscuro himself is an alright boss, but this egg secret really elevates it. The idea of multiple endings is unique for the time. It's time to overview this Triad Rising. Rise of the Triad might be the quirkiest of the 90s FPS's, trying its hardest to reach a Doom level but having a lot of imitations of Wolfenstein 3D blended in. Between that, the epic sounding music, the high octane action, and the Mortal Kombat-esque digitized actors, it has a vibe you just don't see anywhere else. It even had the concept of a bad and a good ending, which certainly Doom and its elk didn't really have, at least to my knowledge. Its maps may not always be successes, but it mostly has very fun and engaging bosses and surprisingly varied maps for something based on Wolf 3D. 